set the drawing for uh, the meeting today? Let me help you out. Oh, oh, okay. See, what we want to do here, Bobby, is make the eyes bigger. That's what's going to really attract the kids and the cheeks bigger. Uh, kind of like... Well, you get the idea. Okay, hey everybody and welcome to Chew Stream where we talk about art and life as an artist. I'm your host Bobby Chu and uh, today it's going to be fun. This is the third version of this challenge. This is the first time I did multiple versions of a challenge. Uh, and the reason is because that's what I do. I don't just stop at one image. You know, I don't just, just stop at one study. Whoa, I almost dropped my computer there and that would have ended the stream but um <laughs> perhaps that just means that this is going to be a really exciting stream today so here are the instructions okay so a 90 minute art challenge complete an illustration 90 minutes based on the image given link to the image in the video details below and as this happens um you'll see that You'll see, actually, you'll see a, a sped up version because I, yeah, awesome question. You know, there is this thing where it's like this mode, um, and I'm sure you've experienced this sometimes as well, where it's this mode where you're not trying to be exact anymore. You're really going with the motion, you're really going with the emotion, and you're really trying to capture the emotion through very almost subconscious like movements of your arm, right? Because you're not trying to be super accurate anymore. Does that make sense? And so with that is kind of like that vein of thinking where like no longer are you trying to um, do the thing that you did last time, but you're trying to take a very loose idea that's probably just very loose in your head and you're putting down almost abstract marks. I would say like 30% abstract, 70% you, are, you have an idea of the energy of the gesture or the subtle, you know, so, some overall sense of the pose, that kind of thing. And you just go with that. That's a mode, I feel, that it's like um, a mode that you can get better at. Um, that we all get better at. Now, one thing I did not too long ago, I think it was like Friday or something. No, it was um, Monday. Last Monday, I did a stream where it was an exercise of I put my pen down. I don't lift it up pretty much. I don't, keep, I don't stop. I don't even know what I'm drawing at first. I'm just drawing a, a shape. You know, I made a squiggly line, made it into a shape that kind of turned into kind of like stairs. So those squiggly lines, I'm not just rand, I'm not 100% going just whatever. I'm more like, at that point, ratio-wise, I'd almost say it's like 50-50. It's these kind of controlled lines, 50% kind of controlled. 50%, I don't even know what the heck I'm doing. I'm just making marks. But the 50% where I'm controlling is so that I don't make just these, you know, uh, Zoom calls. Oh my gosh, I'm oh so sorry. Oh my gosh, so all this time they didn't hear, they heard only So me. let me, let me uh, <laughs> kind of summarize here. You know, Noah's talking about um, having arm problems as well and not being able to, uh, you know, paint and draw the whole entire day. So now you're doing oil painting, which has been a little easier. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just um, for me. I have um, I have a problem uh, with my wrist, so I know already that the small motion of working on Wacom triggers it. You know, it causes mm -hmm. inflammation, and then there's another issue. So I already know I have, I've had it for the last five years or so, and. There are times that it doesn't bother me as much. There are times that it does bother me, but I'm constantly cautious about how I use my arm right now because 
I can't afford to injure myself. I can't afford to like have inflammation and then be out of commission for like two weeks until it goes over. So oil painting is right now, I'm, I'm studying it. It's, I never really done that professionally before, but I do want to get into the gallery um, genre. I want to sell originals and for that, I know that probably oil painting will sell better. Um, it's higher, considered higher quality. And it's something that let I me let me ask you something though, because um like as you're speaking though, I'm just like yeah. thinking, um, do you have a crystal clear kind of desired result that you're searching for with this goal of um, gallery shows? Because well, yeah. with the gallery shows, with the gallery, well, I have my own uh, ten year goal, which I I don't want to share online. Like sure, that. sure. But you but, do have a clear goal, yeah? Well, yeah. Like okay. every time, every time that I feel like um, no, because I'm the reason, uh, yeah, the reason that I'm yeah. asking is just because I just want to like uh, share um, a little story with the audience, if that's all right. Yeah. You know, because um, one of my favorite gallery show experiences, I've had a couple, but this one was really awesome. It was. I think it was like the 35th anniversary of Hello Kitty. Uh, oh, I remember your work from that. Yeah, so there was a gallery show that's happening in Hollywood. And all of these huge, huge fine artists are being asked to contribute to this uh, 35th anniversary. I think it was the 35th. Anyways, um, it was really epic. We went there. Uh, there was like... I, I seem to recall there was like real grass just growing out of the walls. It was really bizarre and cool. And then Paris Hilton showed up. Um, Kamora Lee Simmons showed up and a bunch of other uh, uh, celebrities and things like that. I think Carmen Electra, or I forget, but... Um, Carmen Electra is still a thing. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her in that Michael Jordan uh, documentary, so I was like, eh, oh. maybe she's still a thing. Anyways, um, so the whole entire thing is this is very important to me, and and uh, I don't want to look dumb. I don't want to spend time, patience, some money, uh, whatever, on uh, creating a piece of art, and nobody buys it. Right, so that's that's the dilemma here. I want to do this show. There's way too many people that are on a totally different stratosphere in terms of fine art than I am, and so I'm a little nervous. So what I tend to do with these very important kind of moments uh, or events or things is I think about what is the desired result that I'm searching for, and start with that question to see. How where or how to begin and this is complicated it seems easy but it's complicated that's why you have to do it over and over as well habitually right so i start off with that desired result which is a bunch of people i'm picturing a bunch of people surrounding the painting or looking at the painting and there's a little red dot on it you know meaning that it's sold so that's my desired result. Okay, so start with that question. How do I get to that point? Well, let's picture all the details because details, it's all in the details. The other details is that there are giant statues, much bigger paintings by these very well-known uh, fine artists that have already collectors baked in and they're gonna sell that stuff, mm. right? I don't want people to pass mine. So what's going to make people, I just picture a bunch of bigger things around, a lot of contrast, a lot of paintings. People are walking by and they stop at my painting or they walk by, by slightly, they back up and they look at my painting. Okay, so now I'm starting to clue in on something. What is it about my painting that will stand out? Well, Okay, if it stands out, then that means it's different. How's it different? 
Well, sometimes to find out how things are going to be different, you want to look at how everything else is the same. And something that I started to picture is like all these different paintings, all these different statues, all these different styles. How's mine going to stand out? Well, all of those things slowly after keep picturing that desired result that you want, I started to picture that everything else around, they were all things about Hello Kitty because it's the Hello Kitty anniversary. So mine will be the only thing that isn't in this Hello <laughs> Kitty gallery, right? Mine is the only painting that didn't have Hello Kitty in it. Instead, it had a big, dark creature that was uh, had its paw on one of the Sanrio friends. And all the other Sanrio friends are looking at this thing that has Hello Kitty uh, ears and a bow on its head and a nose disguised as Hello Kitty, right? And that was my painting. It's called Imposter. Oh, I never knew the, the story behind that. Yeah, so that was in the gallery show. And when I got to the gallery show, we looked, you know, we started walking through, started looking at all the different paintings, and some of them had little red dots before the show started. Oh. And mine and Kay's both had little red dots. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Right? So it's like start with that desired result that you're looking for, whether it's awesome. somebody looking through your portfolio and smiling and going, yes. Okay. Yeah. And then backing up, backing up. It's oh. kind of like doing those um, mazes where you cheat and you start from the end. Mm. It's way easier. <laughs> well, for me, it's like I always wanted to do oil painting ever since I was a kid. But there was, was always an easier way to do stuff. And I never had the proper education to do that. So when, um, when my hand travels started, uh, at first, I thought, okay, I'm going to buy a VR headset and I'm going to work in VR. It totally did not fit with me. And last year, what happened was that I was invited to a uh, plein air festival and was sort of an artist residence. And uh, all the artists there, for, for some reason, I understood that I'm expected to do all paintings. And I said, okay, I can't do all paintings, but I can do acrylics. And when we got there, I see all these artists, they're working on huge canvases. And I'm just like, every one of us got their own studio space. And I was very, very intimidated because I've never worked in like huge canvases. And I, I, all I wanted was to walk around the city and, and sketch from real life. Cause that's what plein air is to me. And none of them did that. Sure. And I was like stressing out and tr I tried to start like um, an acrylic painting. And after like a couple of days, I said to myself, you know what, I'm gonna go for a walk. I'm gonna do some sketches and I'm gonna get some ideas and then I'm gonna figure it out. When I got back, I asked our um, host if it will be possible for me to just do watercolors. And I said to sweeten the pills because he's like, this is going for an exhibition and we want to um, in return for our stay there, we have to give them uh, the painting itself. So I told him, like, listen, if okay. I can do some acrylic color, I can do a whole lot of watercolors. I don't have to do. I work really, really small. I studied from Nathan Fox. I I do really small ones, and so I will give you at least six. I will produce more, but I will give you at least six of those paintings for you to use. Because all I wanted to, to do is to do good work, not work in a medium that I'm not that comfortable yeah. with right now. So I ended up giving, making like nine or 10 um, uh, watercolors sketches, and they were the only ones that got uh, sold. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're so different. You stood yeah, out. Yeah, and it's like it for me. It was like an aha moment that okay, I gotta do what I love doing. I gotta do what I um, 
what I'm good at and I enjoy because all I wanted was to be out instead of being in this. Hey, that's <laughs> and that's the perfect combo, too, because it's different and it's something that you enjoy. OK, let's try to include some more people in here because yeah, uh, it's kind of taking up all the time. So, OK, we have also we have uh, questions in Zoom and Slido. So I'm going to go to Zoom first. This one's from Archie. Archie says, hi, Bobby, I'm Archie from Indonesia. I have a question. Oh, let me press this answer live. What does that mean? Okay, so uh, I have this question. When I cr when creating a creature design, is it necessary to draw the anatomy first or just draw the simple basic shapes and combine uh, from any kinds of possible animals? That's great. So anatomy... I kind of think of it like, how much anatomy do I draw when I draw somebody walking around in a fur coat, for example? Uh, when I look at the elbow area, if her or his arm is bent, then I'll be extra, I'll pay extra attention to that because that's a part of the anatomy that will start to stick out at that point. Uh, start to protrude so those areas would start to become a lot more important you see what I'm saying areas where the anatomy um, affects the visual when you see it like you can see the scales wrapping around the muscles or things like that uh, then uh, yeah it becomes important I would definitely pay attention to that and when it's all covered with fur I still draw looser anatomy but still anatomy I'll start to group muscles together start to group forms together because I don't need to get super detailed with them the fur kind of just fluffs everything up anyways awesome and then we have a uh, Slido question this one's from CJ Ellison, when choosing images to do a 90-minute study study from, do you have a long-term learning goal in mind, or is it based on what you're curious about learning that week? Excellent question. Um, long-term learning goal, sometimes. You know, so, for example, hands. Right, hands is something that can be very complicated for a lot of people, but there's also claws, there's also fins, there's also all sorts of different types of paws, feet, hands. Uh, and it's important to see the relationships between all of them to truly, truly master the grabber. Right, that's what your hand is. So uh, for that purpose, I remember when I was studying that, there was a bigger, longer kind of goal in mind. It was to get good at, you know, paws and hands and grabbers. Um, then there's other scenarios like this, for example. These studies here, the kind of goal in mind really is creating different stuff in the same lighting situation. Right, and going back to Noah, going back to what you're saying of like, it's harder for you to kind of think about um, getting away from the reference. But that's, that's totally understandable because that's something that uh, I definitely remember consciously working on. That mode where it's like 50% imagination, 50% just trying to feel it out and then looking at it, looking at those somewhat scribbles and try to make sense of them and then uh, solidify it more and more and more and more. All right. Great question. How do I prepare my portfolio if I want to find a mentor? Hmm. I feel like finding a mentor is really much more about you and how you approach the person rather than um, your portfolio. I've definitely taken on a lot of people where it's like it wasn't because of their art. I would say 
when I say every single person I've taken on to like mentor, yeah, I guess so. Everybody that I've kind of um, spent time mentoring in the past and things like that, it was all because of uh, who they were. You know, I, you got to hang out with these people. So you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to teach somebody that's just full of themselves, even though they're amazing. I try to, you know, that song, you know, sit down, be humble. <laughs> that's what I try to do, right? Just try to be humble. Everybody, pretty much everybody out there. I wonder if this is a true statement. Everybody out there can find somebody that's better than them. Because even the best person will no longer be the best person at some point. I wonder if that's a true statement. Anyways, uh, the most important thing, I think, is that there are no do-overs in life. So take the opportunities in front of you before they pass. And I can tell you right now, um, chaos it generally, it brings the best opportunities. It's not to say love chaos or things like that, but search for the, the silver lining within the chaotic times that we have right now. This is why it works. Because in chaotic times, everything that we were doing doesn't work anymore. We need something else. And it's that need that brings opportunity. Because if we're all good, nobody's going to want to buy your new thing. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to need your new service, your new company, your new whatever. Um, so chaos is really where the best opportunities are found so we just gotta keep looking and that's also a good way for us to just get away from um, just feeling bad you know about this situation and everything anyhow um, why don't we go on to another question okay so this one's from CJ Russoto sorry CJ I, I Put your mic on mute um, just so we have more time to talk with everybody else. So, Bobby, I decided to finish the first uh, Proco's course. Since I'm six out of ten lessons in the morning, I do that. But at night, I want, uh, I want to focus on doing thumbnails from my favorite movies, at least four per day. And my question is, how much time should I spend on them and what to focus when you're not sure what you want to get from that scene. I feel like you're doing a little too much, CJ. I feel like like four studies, four thumbnails from your favorite movies per day, I don't really feel like I would be spending enough time on each of those uh, scenes four scenes I hope it's not four scenes because that's a lot and you're doing these classes this is what I'm talking about when you when we spread ourselves too thin everybody when we spread ourselves too thin it's just harder to get anything done at a outstanding level okay there's there's bad passable good, outstanding. The hardest part to get past is good, I feel. Bad, your stuff is bad, your life is bad, there's reasons for you to change. There's reasons for you to push beyond your comfort zone. You know, nothing really going on, same kind of thing. If there's less reasons because you're out of a bad situation, but you're not in a good situation yet. There's plenty of reasons to push yourself, right? Then you get into good. So you worked hard to get to good, and now your life is 
It's good. It's comfortable. That comfortableness will knock a lot of people off of the off of their beaten track, their beaten path there, right? Because why keep going on this beaten path when things are good now? Right? And a lot of us, we might hear this and go, yeah, there's no reason. But there is a reason. There is a reason because greatness happens after good, after the comfort zone. And you will not get there unless it's from inside, internally. And it's not the environment. It's not your life around you, the outside world that's pushing you forward. It's coming from within. And that's what we need to kind of stoke, that fire. We need to get it hot, burning, right? Because there are no do-overs in life. And right now is an opportunity. Every day is an opportunity. And for us older people that remember a bunch of decades now, we know how fast the decade goes by. And we only have a handful to do awesome stuff. Right? So it's like no matter where we are at this point, it's fun to strive for more, even if you're comfortable. It's challenging and it's so rewarding, so satisfying when you know you put in that, that hardcore effort and you're looking for hardcore effort because most of us that have not spent um, you know, hard times, things like that, most of us, including me, didn't really know what hard work was until we went past that point of giving up, when we would usually give up. With a good life, what point would we usually give up? We're looking towards getting to that point where it's like, if you had a bad life, what point would I give up? That's what I'm thinking about. If I didn't have all these things in my life, all these luxuries, how hard would I be working to get those things? Or to get just luxuries as in freedom of time, not necessarily like, not like bling or nothing. I don't have any things like that. You know, I, I like traveling for sure. I like eating good food for sure. So those are my luxuries, I guess, as well. Uh, but that's, that's such an important thing you know, for all of us, and hopefully you're doing this challenge right now, listeners, you know, you're taking this time to not just hang out, listen, ask questions, talk, but you're on it, you know, you're also drawing, you're also trying to figure out, okay, yeah, let's try to figure out some of those things maybe that I might have said about those different modes of drawing where you're not getting super tight anymore you are forcing yourself to move that pencil around a little bit more loosely trying to figure out what you want to do trying to see where this thing is going that's what it's all about you know there are no doer overs in life it is sunday it is a beautiful weekend i know and absolutely take advantage of that enjoy it but can you enjoy it in a way that will help your life out a little bit more you know enjoy it grab a nice glass of wine or something if it's a nice afternoon outside or something go out have that glass of wine bring a sketchbook put on some music and just draw if you're used to having the tv on all the time maybe just turn it off and enjoy that silence a little bit and draw and draw those hands, draw your hands, if that's the thing that you know, if you're better at this, wow, I think it would really change my life. It would change my abilities, it, noticeably, it would probably change my whole portfolio, and then in turn, get me other kinds, other level kind of jobs. I went on a little bit of a little uh, rant there. But it's a good positive rant, right? Okay. So, answered 
that one. I'm going to go to Slido here. Oh, this is a good one. So this person, Anonymous, was saying, when doing the 90-minute art challenge, do you look at reference or anything? Um, so in the beginning, I do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, in this one, I didn't. You have a link in the details of this video to this image. But that's the reference. And no longer is it on screen. It's not on any other monitor either. Because by this time, I've sketched this, you know, sketched off of that photo so many times now, seven or eight times at least. And now I don't need it. It's in my head. Not only have I kind of at this point, and we could all do this, right? You copy it enough times, you study it enough times in a way where you are thinking, I need to memorize this to a point where I can do this without looking. Uh, and the only way to memorize that really is to understand it. So understanding, understanding, understanding it more and more with every try. And then the seventh, eighth time, I just put it away. I just close it. You know, I'm not looking at anything. I'm actually looking at a little drawing of um, Sailor Moon in my sketchbook because I was doing this like Sailor Moon redraw thing that didn't work out well. It was just a little sketch of super scribbly. Let me see if I could find it. Uh, no, it's not going to be here. But it was a very, very like, you know, 30 seconds at the very most. Just an idea of a creature where the ears are kind of like the the two bulb things on the um on sailor moon's head and that was it and bangs yeah so it's pretty much it's no reference it's just going for it um i recommend to do the same thing because if you could do that then all of a sudden you're creating things totally out of your head and it's based off of something in your mental library and the more you grow your mental library, the more you will um, strengthen a ton of things. That's how Kim Jong-gi could draw everything out of his head with no reference. It's because he has a giant mental library and he's always concentrating on adding to it. All right, so why don't we go on to another uh, question here. This one is in Zoom. So let's go to uh, Mitchell first. Or actually, yeah, let's just go in order so I don't get confused. Uh, Archie says, hi, Bobby. Thank you so much for sharing. I have another question again. What's the difference between a creature design and creature illustration? And what's a good creature design portfolio and or creature illustration look like? This is a really great question. So Archie, uh, creature design, I could see that being a lot sketchier. Um, but then that would be a concept. Also, illustration, okay, I got it. So creature design could be very sketchy because it's a concept. It could be very finalized because it's like the final concept. Um, I would say that they're going to be very similar in many ways. But creature illustration has a lot more freedom, I think, for interesting compositions. You could cover up a good deal of the creature. You could do all sorts of stuff because it's all about the illustrations, all about the storytelling. You can change the perspective. You can have very forced perspective where there's a giant paw coming out at you. But you could imagine if you're doing a creature design for a film, a game, whatever, and you give them a giant paw coming at you, super foreshortening, um, the modelers are going to be like, what are you doing? You know, like, this makes it so much more difficult. Uh, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to analyze your foreshortening and understand how big this 
hand really is, this claw really is on this fictional animal that doesn't exist. So I would have no reference to kind of go off of. Yeah, I guess it wasn't that hard to answer. That would be my answer right there. All right, and uh, back over to Slido. Now, Slido, John, I'm an intermediate that doesn't have much knowledge about anatomy. Where do I start? What would my training regime look like? Um, first thing I thought of is that there's this awesome class on schoolism called Deconstructed, Drawing People with Viktor Kalvachev. If you are into, uh, if that's what you like to do, you like to do characters, uh, that course is fantastic because he goes through anatomy, he goes through styles, he goes through just pencil marks and the differences between different types of pencil marks. And I kid you not, I don't care if you're professional or not, you will like that. You'll be like, oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't really think about it like that. You know, what's the difference between cross hatching, where it's vertical lines, horizontal lines versus diagonal lines, diagonal lines? You know, and he is very specific. And it's a fantastic, fantastic course. Um, highly, highly recommended. It's doing amazingly well for a reason. Uh, the other thing I would do is, so say you don't have a schoolism class, okay? But I wanted to mention, of course, because we're talking about it, and it's down below, that I've been doing content on my channel for like, you know, we're doing it 12 days straight because it's... Uh, only a bunch of days left before the end of our sale. $198 gets you a year subscription to all the content on Schoolism, over 30 plus courses, plus artist workouts, where you work out with Nathan Fowkes is the newest one. Uh, Steven Silver also has one. And you're doing these art workouts with them where you can see them doing it as well, right? And that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so sale ends June 5th. I think that's Friday. So get on it, you know. And what a great way to uh, give somebody, um, you know, art education for under 200 bucks. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Victoria Ying, actually, because she started something that was fantastic she put out something where it's just she was giving out three free uh year subscriptions actually she gave out way more she gave out three specifically to um black artists in america you know there's a lot of craziness going on in uh, america right now but she also gave away i think like 30 I want to say 30 uh, s scholarships for schoolism, year scholarships on top of that for anybody uh, that applied. So huge, huge uh, shouts out to her for helping out the art community. All right, let's go to uh, Zoom now. And by the way, I want to let everybody know the time that you have left, okay? We started this about 45 minutes ago, so we have about 45 minutes left. Okay, Zoom question from Mitchell Bell. Hey Bobby, I've been teaching myself how to draw and do art for the past three months now. I don't have money for college or anything, uh, and kind of like going my own way anyhow. Just wondering how you go about massively leveling up on your own. In my journey, I'm leaning towards doing graphic novels. Being a novelist already, I'd love to bring my own pictures to my work. What a fantastic goal, Mitchell. Um, learning by yourself 
so well if if you could for those of you out there that are like yeah i'm in that situation uh story driven illustrations with camilla uh, or jamila kanoff excuse me jamila uh, fantastic. She is great. Not only is she an amazing artist, but um, she studied about education, teaching, I believe. I'm pretty darn sure that's what she told me. So her teaching is fantastic. Very, very good. Uh, but of course, we want to help out everybody, even if you're not you know, on, uh, you're not able to have schoolism subscriptions or anything. So Mitchell, if you have absolutely, you know, no resources, that's okay. You have the internet, you found, you know, you can watch this stream anyways. There's definitely a ton of things that you can look at and do. You could, uh, what I would do if I was you, because you have a very specific goal here as well. So I'd think about that graphic novel or uh, the, yeah, you said graphic novel. So I think about that graphic novel. I think about your desired result. So obviously people are picking it up. They're looking at it. They're reading it. Okay, well, who is that person? Who is your avatar? Who is that uh, the most applicable person out there? Right? How old are they? Where do they live? Do they live in an apartment? Do they live in a house? Do they live? Where are they reading this? every little detail that you can find and start to work your way backwards where did they buy this thing what was the context of the place that they were buying this in you know it was this on a website if so where would it be how would your thing look compared to everything else around uh, on that website and why would they go to yours all these things, you know, and slowly start peeling it back. And um, at the same time, you're looking at that piece of art. What is that graphic novel? What does it look like? Is it three-toned with um, lines? Is it painterly? Is it, you know, whatever it might be, traditionally done, things like that. And you want to make sure that all your other kind of visions coincide with that vision of what what the graphic novel art looks like inside. Then you'll be able to know what you need to learn. Right? Because if it's very painterly or something, then you might want to go to painterly artists. Alex Ross comes to mind uh, if you want to do something more traditional. Francis Manipal, um, Dustin Nguyen come to mind, uh, and Alex Ross, but his stuff looks extremely time-consuming. Um, realism, you know, if lighting is a thing, animated version, but very realistic lighting, then you might want to look at something, somebody like uh, Ryan Lang. He's working on his own graphic novel. And then with those things, same kind of thing. I would study them just like I'm studying this over and over again with different objectives in mind until you really absorb and you really try to get every little bit of information out of, um, out of that study, out of those things until the point where you don't need to look at it anymore and you could start to do your own versions, your own riffing off of that study uh, in different ways. Graphic novels, it's not easy because you are pretty much everything. You're a story artist, you're the director, you're a character designer, layout, um, everything, environments, everything. But it's a great goal. And I think it's, you know, you should stick to it, uh, especially if you know that that's your dream, especially if you know that's something that you can do. I would totally. All right. Oh, shoot. What I do here? I just. 
I just closed a bunch of, um, okay. Henry asks in Zoom, Hi, Bobby, I'm illustrating backgrounds for a children's book, and I've received some feedback that it looks too similar to the style of Studio Ghibli, which I was really disappointed. While I love Ghibli and I'm inspired by them, I worried, I'm worried that it looks like I'm ripping them off. As an artist, do I have an obligation to change what I've done, even though it was unintentional? Henry, uh, that's up to you. For me, I would, for me, I would say yes. Like I, I would want to change it. Um, th that's why I always tell people study multiple artists, study multiple sources. Because when you're learning a million different ways to do the same thing, it's what you end up doing tends to be uh, completely different than anything else. It really becomes much more of like this natural style. It looks neat though. I like, I love Studio Ghibli. I was just watching um, Spirited Away yesterday. And the character designs, oh my goodness. The things that they choose to animate in that film is absolutely insane. You know, just the hands on the, uh, the witch in Spirit Away, wrinkly, knuckly, and multiple elaborate rings and everything just for her hands. My goodness. Um... All right. And let's go on to another uh, Slido question. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope everybody's still concentrating. We have a little bit over half an hour left. Just keep those uh, pencils, those tablet pens moving. Keep that brain moving. Keep trying to visualize what it is that you're going towards, what you're painting what you want your painting to look like in the end. All right. Um, Anonymous asks, what do you look for when selecting a reference image for the kind of challenge you're doing right now? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question too. I, I kind of, I look at the beauty of the subject um, and I think about what it is I want to learn from it. It's kind of like looking at art, you know? You see a piece of art, what do you like about that art? If there's nothing, you kind of move on. If there's something that you really like, then yeah, I'm in it. I'm going to do this one. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a piece of art, as we know. Like, uh, Tuesday's stream, the next image that we're studying, it is this one, Lord of the Rings. And that'll be really fun because I'm a huge uh, Lord of the Rings fan. I love those that series. Uh, the costume design, uh, everything, everything. The environments, the props. Um, yeah, fantastic. I feel like watching it now. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it's kind of like looking at good art. Who do you want to study? That becomes an even simpler kind of um, answer in my head when I think about it, right? You look at some art and you're like, I don't want to copy this. I don't, I don't feel like trying that. Um, and some art you do. Okay. Yeah, somebody's saying in the chat, in the YouTube chat, I always had that with all the arms of the boiler room guy. They animated that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Spirited away, the boiler room guy. It's like six arms or something and two legs. I don't even know if he has legs. I forget. Okay. So what's next here? Let's go back to, let's just go back and forth. Let's go to Zoom. Archie, thank you again for sharing. I have another question. No problem. Um, how do you find your own voice to be a professional artist until now? 
because I'm not sure that art could be my main career, but I'm still searching for answering who I am, what I want to be, uh, but I still learn anything I like. Archie, wow, good question again. Finding your own voice as a professional artist, first of all, um, it's really looking for knowledge. For me, I'm sure there's other people that do things in other ways and there's many people that might be successful doing things in other ways. But um, I feel like it's really a search for knowledge. My way has my own logic, okay? And that, that logic is when you don't have options and you don't have knowledge, then how will you know how you want to present yourself when you don't have all the options, right? And you go and search for how, you know, how as many people do this, uh, do the same thing, paint and draw, um, and how they think about things in many different ways, then you start to build options. And then when you start to learn from enough people, you start to find these correlations. You start to find these similarities between one person and another person, how they do things. And then you can also find new ways of doing things because you're like, that person does it that way. This other person does it this way. If I take that aspect of what they do and this aspect of what that person does, put them together, I got something new. You know, so for example, um, Bouguereau, the classic painter Bouguereau doing all these beautiful, very soft lighting paintings. If you ever get like a, a big version of one of his a big, you know, big image of one of his paintings and you really zoom in, you'll see that he, he uses lines. He uses colored lines a lot of times. They're so thin, you don't really notice, but you feel it. Like a really warm kind of painting, he might use a very thin red line in parts in like the lighter parts of the painting or something. And it just gives it that extra tiny bit of crispness and warmth at the same time. Now you might not be interested in doing soft lighting paintings, but you can take that little tiny aspect of that very thin line and the crispness and the, the feeling that it gave you and apply it to something totally different, right? And you could take um, Zorn's the kinds of lighting that Zorn liked to do and start to see how can I incorporate linear, very thin linear accents, linear outlines of things uh, the way that Bouguereau did it. Just, just an example, but that's a, I think that's a pretty cool example. It makes me think, what would that look like? That would be cool. How could I also incorporate that into creatures now right and you could see some of this riffing that's been going on with these studies because this is the ninth subject that we've been studying right? and and some of them if you go back to i think is the fifth one the bird on the branch i start to combine things things that i liked about the bird on the branch with a lighting scheme of frederick remington's uh moonlight wolf painting and so on and so forth, right? It's, that's why learning is so much fun. It's so much fun, you know, and, and um, we can't fail at this. You try, well, most of our paintings, most of our tries will never be perfect. Um, and what, it, you know, like, what is perfect anyways? I don't think there's any such thing. So it's really about the effort that you're putting in, the you know, the fun that you're getting out of it and and just make sure that um just make sure that you don't give up cuz I know 
this road for a lot of us, especially if you're more in the beginning or something like that, it's very easy to feel like it's daunting. If you're struggling with drawing right now and you're looking at this painting, this might be very daunting for you. You know, thinking about creating lighting by yourself out of your head, that could be daunting for you. I know I've had my moments before I was really professional where I was in school thinking, I would love to paint things realistic out of my head, but is that possible? And really questioning it, I had no idea. I could tell you it is possible. It is totally possible, uh, especially when you are constantly going at it, constantly trying to improve, trying to learn, and constantly trying to figure out better ways tinkering right because sometimes the smallest changes can make the biggest differences you know and the only true failure is giving up um, that's not to say of course if you are going in the wrong direction and you realize you're going in the wrong direction change directions I don't see that as being as giving up it's altering your your mission you know giving up to me means that uh it's too daunting i give up i'm scared i give up right we don't want to do that we do want to make sure that we're climbing towards the right goal though we want to make sure it's the right tree that we're climbing up that there's fruit on the top <laughs> and you're going to want to be in that tree. You know what I mean? Some people, they they commit to goals that um, they think that they want. But they're not sure. Deep down, when they think about it, they're not sure. Just like when I went to business school. Once I went there, I was like, yeah, this wasn't what I wanted. Um. Let's go to another question here in Slido here. So Slido Maha, how do I, how to improve my art if I have a blind imagination? I can't visualize my final piece. I have to draw it to see it. I have a blind imagination. And she wrote um, an actual word here. A fan, a fantasia, something like that. What does that mean? Oh, wow. Okay, a mental condition characterized by an inability to voluntarily visualize mental imagery. Many people with this also report an inability to recall sound, smell, sensations, or touch. Oh, that's very interesting. I actually, you know what? You're okay, though. You're okay. There's benefits in that. I know a very successful artist that is like that. Uh, and he loves it because, um, well, because he's a very positive person, always looks on the bright side of things. And he goes, um, then he doesn't get locked into tropes you know, certain ways of doing things. So I would say for you, it's really like, uh, now that you know this, it's really about surrounding yourself with good reference to have things to riff off of. Um, yeah. Great, great question. Okay. Uh, Let's go to the next one here, uh, Finn. I was sad to hear that Lightbox was canceled this year since the first was v really special. What is your long-term vision for Lightbox? Any big cha changes coming? Yeah, a huge one. We're still doing Lightbox. It's going to be online. You will be able to get in, in no matter where you live. Um, there will be a suggested price for people that would want to support Lightbox, but 
um, it's a suggested price because we want to be totally inclusive. If you have no means to pay for, uh, you know, joining in in the experience, uh, be participating, and you know all that good stuff, like that last person was saying that they don't have the funds, they don't have the means to get any kind of education, not even two hundred dollars for a schoolism subscription. Um, in that case, this is for you guys. You can choose to pay zero if you can't. We still want you to come. We still want you to enjoy because, you know, it's the art community coming together, right? And we take care of each other. Um, and we try to generally, we try to do good things. The art community, so awesome. Okay. Um, now, and I want to emphasize, there's no do-overs in life. So take the opportunities that are in front of you. Like I was mentioning before, uh, Lightbox Expo online. You know, put it on your calendar, September 11th to 13th. It will be fun. It will be awesome. And there will be tons of people coming. You will see. Okay. Hope everybody's going to be excited for that. Now, Zoom. Okay, Archie. Oh, sorry, I answered that. Let me go to the next one. Jennifer, Jennifer Kane, can you share what equipment and software you're using? I'm using, um, I don't know what size Cintiq, but it's the biggest size. I think it's 32 inch. I'm not sure. Um, whatever that biggest size is. And software, I'm using Adobe Photoshop. That was simple. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, next one is um, Jesse on Zoom. How can we download your brushes? Oh, that's so simple. Okay, so right now I'm using a basic brush. It's just the default brush comes with Photoshop. It's just that circle. It's a hard edged circle and uh, it's really in the way that I use that brush. So I tend to mess around with my flow uh, options a lot more. But of course, I go into details in my course on schoolism, uh, digital painting techniques. But what I do um, is for organic things, I tend to tone down my flow to about 20%, 10%. Um, my spacing on my brush is 25% for the Photoshop people out there. Um, yeah, no, no pressure sensitivity for opacity or flow, but there is pressure sensitivity for the uh, size of the brush. And there's, like I said, there's a lot more to it. Um, if you want to learn more, you could definitely check it out in the uh, digital painting class on digital painting techniques on schoolism or digital painting with me on schoolism. Okay, next one here on Slido. CJ, what's something art related or non art related that you'd like to learn that you haven't yet? Uh, it's so dumb. Just dancing. I want to learn some dance moves uh, that I've been checking out on TikTok because I'm on TikTok now, guys. You gotta check me out. Uh, encourage me. You know, I'm just having fun, but uh, some encouragement would be awesome. Digital Bobbert is my username. There's no dance videos on TikTok of me, by the way. I don't think there will be. Uh, but who knows? <laughs> okay, so that was cool. Let's go to another Slido question here. How should I prepare my portfolio if I... Oh, got that one. Um, I'm an advanced intermediate artist and want to become a live action filmmaker. 
Do you have advice on what I should practice to improve my art for visualization? If you want to be a filmmaker, now you got to start looking at like, okay, you want to be familiar with cameras, lenses, you know, like what type of lens would you want for this shot? What type of lens would you want for this shot? You would want to start to know pretty much everything, at least a little bit, uh, the kinds of lighting, the kinds of lights, live action. You're dealing with a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Uh, I've never made a live action film, so I wouldn't even be able to tell you. But if you want to work on live action films as an artist, then really I would, I would definitely do the challenge that's coming up on Tuesday because that's Lord of the Rings, that's live action, you know, and, and uh, for you to be an artist in live action, you want to be able to learn how to paint and draw realism out of your head a lot of times you know because like if they could just take a picture of something then they don't need you to paint it all right and it looks like we have about 15 minutes left 15 minutes left um I see C CJ Russoto has his hand up. Let me go. Okay, you got the mic, CJ, if you want to uh, ask another question. Okay, so I'm going to go to uh, one of the questions that were typed into Zoom. Mitchell, thank you for answering. Thank you for the amazing answers. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for the encouraging comment there uh, for my questions and the others it's all great feedback oh great uh, I do in fact have enough money for schoolism and art books was looking for more of an idea of how uh, you would go about as a beginner uh, three months ago getting a getting way better way quicker so that I can actually st uh, storyboard my graphic novel what should my day-to-day -day routine be, basically, in your opinion? That way I can compare your idea to what I've been doing. Ah. Uh, um, how I would do this is... <laughs> and this is, yeah, like you said, this is just my way. But I am very kind of like, I feel like I'm always trying to think of logic, right? So I would start studying graphic novels that I like, copying them out, um, and really just feeling it. When you copy it out, then you kind of really feel it in a different way. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, if I did, especially when I was studying Mike Bignola stuff, it seems simple. Then you start copying it out and you're like, oh, wow. Um, whoa, what's going on with uh, CJ there? I'm going to mute you, CJ. Um, yeah, once you start copying out, then you really start to hear all, or you start to see all of the complexities to that it takes to get so simplified, things like that. So um, study and copy all these different graphic novels that I would love. And then I'd do it again in a different way. Perhaps if I changed the, the character, perhaps I changed the proportion slightly. I changed this one from night to day and so on and so forth and, and get further and further away until you're doing a Sailor Moon version of this creature and, you know, like until it becomes your own. Now, if you don't, if you're, you, you're saying that you're an early beginner, though. So I would take some classes on either story, storyboarding, comics, all three, perhaps. Try to find that. Um, of course, if you, like you said, you can, uh, you do have enough money for schoolism. 
So then I would recommend a couple courses here for specific reasons. Storyboarding with Chris Pern, because he talks about camera shots and really a, uh, and how that relates to storytelling. And he's phenomenal. And now he's a director, you know, so he knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah, that would be a really great one. Gesture drawing with Alex Wu because you're going to really need to understand posing. You're going to really need to understand how to draw people or just things um, acting. Another one I would suggest would be Camil uh, Jamila Kanoff's uh, class that I was mentioning earlier, Story Driven Illustrations. Because just by the name of it, you could tell why that's going to be important to you, help you tell your story. Anonymous attendee. Okay, so you wrote in here, will there be another free portfolio review? Where can we submit our portfolios again? So anonymous, uh, you are in luck because I, I love the last one. It was really fun and it was nice to help people draw on top of their paintings and such and to talk with them as I'm doing it. Um, First, we are, we've opened it up to the Schoolism subscription group to submit their portfolios. Uh, definitely want to show our appreciation to the Schoolism community. Monday, we open it up to the public, everybody else. Okay, so that's tomorrow. Um, what you would do is you would be given instructions on where to submit, what to say, uh, in your portfolio and things like that. And that'll be tomorrow. And you can look for uh, instructions and things on social media, schoolism, uh, schoolism live, my, my social media as well. Should be fun. I love the last one. It was really great. Saw some amazing portfolios and it's really nice to show them how they can turn it up a bunch of different notches. Hmm. I'm just seeing on YouTube uh, just a quick question in the chat there. Can you talk about the Art Station Challenge? Yeah, so there's an Art Station Challenge, Mystery Box Challenge. It's kind of like the uh, Lightbox Expo is helping to hold a contest, hold a challenge, I should say, on Art Station. And uh, this challenge is actually the biggest challenge they've ever had in terms of sponsors in terms of prizes this challenge has the most sponsors the most prizes that they've done so check it out not only that but you're gonna have really awesome jurors looking at your stuff so that that's really great that's how uh that played a big role in how i started my career it's just doing challenges and then because I did those challenges people noticed me and then gave me opportunities okay let's go to um, let's go to Slido here anonymous asks should I take one class and focus on it uh, one month then take another one or take two or three classes Actually, it, it really, like, if you find a class, I'd say what you're saying here is great. Take one class, focus on it for a month, and then decide if you want to keep focusing on it or if you want to redo the whole entire thing a lot more methodically or in a different way, whatever. But what I would suggest is you know surf through all the different classes if you have a school some subscription you have the entire uh, library to just go through you know uh, hundreds of hours of uh, videos over 30 plus courses i think it's closer to like 35 now or something like that um yeah and just find that thing that you really gel with 
And then I would really get on that and just get obsessive about it and force myself to put it on every time I'm drawing. You know, even if I'm not drawing that thing, even if I'm doing some other work, if I don't have to think about things in terms of like uh, typing things out, having to read something, then I just put it on. And it doesn't matter if I'm listening to only 30% of it. Let yourself drift in and out. If you constantly have it on, that makes it so much easier to truly, truly uh, have it like absorbed into your skull, you know? That's what I did with Tonko House, the Tonko House course, uh, Painting with Light and Color. Um, I took it with a critique as well with uh, Cody Gramstad. He didn't know that I was uh, that I was me. I had an alias, right? So I could get like the same kinds of uh, paintovers and things like that that he was giving everybody else, which is great because he was very harsh with me and I loved it. Uh, not harsh, very thorough. I would say very thorough. No mean words, but. Um, picked on every little aspect, which was fantastic. Anyhow, uh, that one, that one, you know, I got quite obsessive over. I would put it on while I'm working on movies, whatever. I just have it playing in the background uh, and constantly just like look over a little bit. Oh, you hear something good? Look over. Until the point where I knew what was coming next. I knew what I was going to say next. I, you know, I knew all these lessons. I knew when Dice was going to uh, make a joke <laughs> with Robert, things like that. Uh, that's what I, I would do because really what's more powerful? Kind of looking at everything and seeing a little bit of everything or really kind of mastering one. And then after you master that one, or you can't really master anything, I would say, or some people would say for art, but you know what I mean, like getting really stinking good, getting very, very comfortable with that aspect of art, then you move on to another and another. Just like these studies here, you'll start to see correlations. You'll start to see how one aspect could be added to another aspect of a different class or a different kind of thinking and you start to create your own uh, and then you start to create your own identity your own your own style and things like that and yes there's many of us that could say yeah i came up with my own style by sitting at my desk and drawing for five hours and i came up with a style it's like great that style also is very legitimate but what i'm saying the style that I'm saying would be based heavily on multiple layers of very, very smart um, techniques, smart knowledge, smart foundations, because it's taken from all these other giants that we're standing on the shoulders of, right? And that's what it's all about. That's why it's awesome. Uh, if you think that there's nothing left to learn, not you know anonymous over here, but anybody out there. One time, I when I was teaching in college, this is over 15 years ago. I was teaching um, life drawing, and there's this there's this uh, young artist there, 21 years old, best in the class, or one of the best. And then um, I taught a little screwed up, you know, I taught on how much you improved, not how good you drew, because to me, it doesn't matter how good you draw, because you're nowhere even close to your potential now. You're all like, you know, early 20s, you got so much potential. So I don't want to have people feel like it's how good you draw, that's going to determine how good your career is going to be no because you have so much to grow so i told everybody uh how good you improve is truly going to tell you how your career is going to be because if you're improving constantly um 
you know, I'll feel safe. I'll, I'll feel like, okay, I did my job and you'll do great with your career. If you're painting and drawing good amongst your peers um, or great amongst your classmates and you feel like you're the stuff or that you're really good and you don't need to try as hard, well, guess what? All the people that are improving quickly, even though they might be at a you know, lower level than you, they will surpass you big time. Um, and these were the kinds of little lessons that I talked to them about uh, in, in the classes that I taught, not just drawing, how to draw. I would do that too, of course. But uh, that's what, that's why I try to pass on to them. You know, one person was like, well, you know, the person that I was saying that was pretty much one of the best in the class, if not the best, 21 years old said, well, that's not fair. You know, like that person is used to getting very high marks, right? And I'm saying, you won't get high marks if you don't improve in my class. You'll get very bad marks, even if you're drawing very well. Um, because who cares? Nobody looks at your marks anyways when you're looking for a job. I'm trying to help them, give them the most important things. And his, his uh, response was, well, that's not fair because I'm already really good. So it's really hard for me to improve. what you know you're 21 years old uh, i don't care how good any 21 year old is first of all there's unlimited knowledge out there you haven't learned everything you know so for all of us me included absolutely included if we think that there's nothing left to learn it's the sign of a bad future to come right it's a sign of a very bad future to come because we're delusional. And that artist was delusional. I hope that person turned around because um, I probably did too because that person was a very smart person and it's just a little delusional. All right, why don't we go on to another uh, question here. So uh, let's go to Zoom. Tom, Tom Dale. Hey, Bobby, I've noticed that some digital artists say they don't like to use the black and white color method to create an image as colors can be not as vibrant. But is there a situation where using this method is a better route? Yeah, for sure. I say it's a very legitimate way. I do both, as you guys can tell. Like sometimes I go uh, tonal first, sometimes I go straight into color. And, but that also kind of speaks about my general uh, learning philosophies where it's like learn how to do everything in multiple ways as many times as possible. Right? Um, so here's a scenario. That oil painting, uh, Noah was talking about oil painting earlier. I don't know, Noah, if you've tried out um, Tom Flaherty's oil painting class, the uh, Dutch not Flemish. Yet. What's not it? yet. I really want to take it. I right took it. It's fantastic. I mean, <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> right, now, right now I'm uh, working with John, with Jonathan Hardesty. So I'm oh. taking his approach. Oh, great. And, yeah, and his approach is a bit different. And I know that I'm the type of person that... Uh, needs to do one thing and then move to the other perfect i think you're doing the right thing i was just mentioning that uh in this stream because i wanted to tell everybody that the dutch flemish uh, approach to oil painting is monochromatic first mm -hmm. right so tom dale you're saying black and white that's also monochromatic here's a simple solution you do your black and white monochromatic thing, and then you colorize it uh, burnt umber. Now you got an underpainting. And now you could go about it in the traditional Dutch Flemish oil painting method, or many others that start off with a monochromatic uh, underpainting. And does it work for them? Yeah. 
you don't hear that term like Dutch Flemish oil painting technique for no reason at all. It's because it's it's a very, very legitimate uh, way of painting that's lasted, you know, well over a hundred years. So, yeah, there's always, you know, so many different ways to do uh, the same thing, like I said, and all of them are, can be very awesome. So keep your, keep your minds open, right? Keep your mind and heart open, actually, because that's, that's the only way great um, opportunities and great relationships can build. Now, one other thing I want to kind of mention here before we go on is that um, there's been a lot of goals here talked about. The graphic designing or the graphic novel one comes to mind, the life draw, uh, the live action. Uh, working in live action comes to mind. I don't know where these people live. I don't know where they are in the world. I don't know what their situations are. Some of you are often, you know, different lands, different countries, small these villages, big cities, things like that. And some of you might think wow, I'm going to need a lot of luck to get to my goal. Uh, but many of us know that person that constantly plants lucky seeds, you know, seeds of potential opportunities uh, will grow lucky fruit and something will sprout. We don't need everything to, um, to bear fruit. If you change your thinking to this way of thinking, then uh, you won't get discouraged as much. So the idea is that you're trying to constantly put yourself into positions where something lucky could happen. So uh, attending Lightbox Expo online, Lightbox Expo, uh, going to a workshop, uh, being better at art also you know, posting stuff, posting better art also helps to, that's a, the equivalent of planting seeds of potential luck. And really all we need is one or two of these hundreds of seeds to grow. All the other ones could be good deeds, good effort, good um, things that you did for people and they all didn't bear fruit. That's totally fine because you just need one or two to do that. And once you do, uh, then it becomes easier to grow that second uh, lucky fruit tree, <laughs> whatever my analogy is. All right. Uh, let's go to, oh, here's a good question on Slido. Anonymous asks, Oh, you know what? Okay, last question here. Do I need to draw a hyper-realistic portrait before I can make it on my own in my own style? No, you totally don't. But what you need is like, again, like um, a good, good mental library of options of things that you can do. Because if you don't have any of that, then. Uh, well, that's what drawing a realistic portrait to draw a stylized portrait later is all about. It's about collecting all this info. It's about whether it's in your mental library or just you're going to have it there on the side afterwards again as well. Um, yeah, that it's very much the same kind of thing. Uh, you're studying from this thing so that you have a bunch of knowledge that now you can use to manipulate, to change, to riff off of, to create your own style. Uh, excuse me. Hi. <laughs> uh, can, can I say something about that? Uh, super quick, super quick, uh, CJ. Yeah, that's exactly what 
was Steven Silver teaching his third lesson on the fundamental class, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we've all done this for people that are character designers. You're studying from the real thing and extrapolating information from it, taking really good um, knowledge, uh, things that you might have learned just from copying it first. He's definitely talked about like there's like a wolf example whether it was in the class or he was telling me live i forget but the whole entire thing was that he had a wolf design that he had to do and so he copied a bunch of wolves first just from photos just drawing them and then he threw them out right put them away closed them up and then just start drawing from his imagination now that his brain is fresh with wolf information and there you go okay webinar is done or challenge is done uh thank you so much for everybody tuning in again tomorrow we're going to be opening up the uh, submissions for portfolios so look out for that on social media and if you're not on a schoolism class and you're always wondering you're always interested now is the best time i kid you not our sale ends June 5th. So after June 5th, annual subscriptions will still be very affordable, but it will be $300, just a little bit under $300. Right now, it's $198. So you save over $100 for an entire year of education. Recommend it. Recommend it to your friends. Get on it. Take advantage. And uh, thanks for joining in.